Greetings, everyone. Um, my name is Amy Burnside from the Flow Cytometry Core Facility here at University of Massachusetts Amherst. And I believe everyone has connected. Um, if I could get a few thumbs up from everybody, that would be awesome. So I can make sure that everybody can hear. Great, thank you guys. <clears throat> so um, the core facility is excited to announce that we received a grant um, from the MLSC. And um, this is the Massachusetts Life Science Center. And uh, um, oh, I lost my, I have too many windows open, so forgive me. Um, but we have um, a capital grant award from the Massachusetts Life Science Center um, for the purchase of a SciTech Aurora spectral flow cytometer. Uh, this is the latest and greatest in flow cytometry. It's capable of doing 40 parameters, um, maybe not at once, uh, but it does have 40 parameter capabilities. Um, and Eleanor Kincaid um, is, has come to us from SciTech to give us a background about our new instrument. It's located in LSL um, for those LSL occupants who are excited about a flow cytometer in the building. Um, and it's in the biophysical characterization um, lab right now. Um, hopefully it will stay there for a little while. We haven't quite decided where if it will move, um, but if it gets good use there, we may just keep it. <clears throat> um, Eleanor comes to us, uh, background from um, Harvard and then a graduate degree PhD um, at UCSF. Um, and then <clears throat> um, has did a postdoc uh, closer to us at UMass Worcester, right, King Eleanor? Um, and then again, I've lost my, um, uh, and her postdoc was with Kenneth Rock uh, studying immunoproteasomes and thymoproteasomes. Um, she's been at the Whitehead Institute uh, and has now been at, with SciTech for two years. And um, I think they're very fortunate to have, have Eleanor. Um, she gave us a training in person last week uh, and it was fantastic. Um, so Eleanor, thank you for taking the time out of a, what I know is a very busy schedule for you um, uh, to give us a uh, heads up on what we have with our new pieces of equipment. Great. And with that, I'll let you take over. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. So um, the goal of this talk is to give an overview of the instrument, how it fits in with other technologies, and I hope inspire you to think of which experiments that you're planning would be a really good fit for the instrument, or let's say to introduce you to the idea of things that you could do, and then knowing what's possible, you can plan experiments to, you know, fit the tools that are already on your campus. So, um, this uh, talk includes some background. It doesn't go into the nitty gritty of troubleshooting your data. There are some more advanced talks. And if you're interested in me coming back in the future and giving a more advanced talk, I can. But uh, from my understanding, the point of this was just to be sure that everyone on campus knew that this resource was available and that you can reach out to me if you are trying to figure out if it's going to be a good fit for your planned experiment. OK, so I am going to talk briefly about SciTech. I'm going to actually, I think I took that out because I think I felt that it was not super relevant for this talk, but I'm going to jump mostly right into spectral cytometry. I'm going to talk a little bit about the hardware. Again, you guys already have an instrument, so I don't need to sell you on the instrument, but I just want to let you know how that fits into the experiments you might want to do on it. Uh, and we're going to talk about what, again, what experiments are especially well suited to be transferred onto the SciTech. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the data that we've acquired to, again, give you an idea of how this is gonna fit into experiments that you have already planned or that it might inspire you to plan some new experiments. Okay, so uh, just to sort of talk about how spectral cytometry fits into the history of flow cytometry. So, Flow cytometry came on the market as a commercial product in 1980. And the idea was that you could 
look at an extremely large number of single cells. And you could get not just one piece of information, not just one color of information off of them, but you could use two floors at the same time to get much more complex information than had been previously available. And in a single cell with really statistically significant numbers. So that was why everyone was so excited about flow cytometry. And I would say when I was an undergraduate, we started seeing the flow cytometry paper specifically in the HIV field. So the idea of, you know, CD4 to CD8 ratios was a, a huge um, thing that people could see very dramatically once flow cytometry was available as a tool. So um, about 10 years later, a second laser was introduced. In addition, some additional dyes that could be used in flow cytometry were added. One of the things to keep in mind about flow cytometry, unlike confocal microscopy, you're only exciting with certain wavelengths of laser. So you are limited to the reagents you can use because it has to be something that can be excited by the standard lasers that are available in flow cytometry. So a second laser was added and then you got to add APC. So you got even more dimensions that could be added to your data. Uh, 10 years later, another laser, the violet laser was added. And again, uh, new reagents like Pacific Blue then became available. 10 years later, the big innovation was not in additional lasers, but in additional floors. This was the uh, discovery of polymer dyes and a explosion of new tandem dyes that came on the market, really opening up the possibility of much more complex assays that could be done again on a single cell basis. So all of this was done using the same basic design. And that is you have a particle that is in a fluid phase. So one thing you know about flow cytometry is you're losing all positional data when you're looking at flow cytometry because it always has to be done on a, a single cell suspension is, is generally how you're doing it. Then you send this single file stream of cells past one or more lasers. And then they are, uh, you get light scattered off of the particles, and then you also get uh, fluorescence. Uh, so you excite them with the lasers you have available, and then they emit at different wavelengths. You collect that emitted light. You need very sensitive detectors because each cell is very small and not very much light is actually emitted from each cell. The way that you conventionally were able to tell the colors apart is you had a series of bandpass filters, actually dichroic mirrors, but we generally talk about them as bandpass filters. And each bandpass filter allowed certain wavelengths of light to pass and sent all of the other wavelengths on to the next detector. And then the wavelengths of light that pass were called that color. So you have one filter equals one color, whether that is uh, Fitzy versus PE or Fitzy versus PE versus uh, Percy P versus APC, whatever those colors are, that was defined by the combination of lasers and filters that you had. The problem is that this caused some serious limitations in how large the assays could go. You just couldn't deconvolute the signal if you tried to pack too many filters into the system using the tools that were previously available. So uh, that's where spectral cytometry comes in. The idea is that even in 2017, before whole new categories of reagents that are specific to spectral cytometry came on the market, we were able to take the conventionally available reagents and the conventionally available lasers and get many more colors packed together. And that is a combination of our hardware and the algorithm that we're using that allows us to pack many, many more reagents into um, 
the spectrum space that was already available. And then more recently, we expanded the number of lasers, and this allows you to take advantage of more reagents and also to uh, pack more reagents into that space. And more and more reagents are coming on the market. We are um, have just recently also started selling reagents, and we have a immunophenotyping kit that we are selling that is very spectral specific. So um, if that's something you're interested, you can reach out to me and I will send you to the reagents team. It can be a way to jump straight into spectral cytometry uh, in a kit format while you're coming up with your more specific assay. Okay, so uh, how is it, how can you, pack more floors in using spectral cytometry. So um, first, I'm going to take a step back and talk about conventional cytometry. So PE is one of the first reagents that was ever used in flow cytometry. Uh, the first laser in flow cytometry is the 488 blue laser. So we'll start by talking about the blue laser. So no floor has a perfectly sharp like rectangular excitation and emission, it's always got this kind of, you know, elongated, broad, spready emission. But because we've, um, in conventional cytometry, one filter is assigned to each floor, you just capture as much of it, as much of that emission as you can, and you call that PE. What do you do about the parts that fill outside of this bandpass filter that you've assigned to PE? Well, some of it you just ignore. If there's no filter that this light can go through to get to a detector, then it may as well not exist. You're ignoring it. But the other issue is that some of this light is being emitted at wavelengths that have actually been assigned to other floors. And this is why it's hard to keep packing floors in, in conventional cytometers, is that it's very hard to design a set of filters that will allow you to distinguish floors that have very, very similar excitations and emissions. And so what do you do with this information? For those of you who are already using conventional flow cytometry, you know that what you do is compensation. You run single stain controls, and then you go through either a hand compensation or an autocomp wizard, and you um, it enables you to pull those signals apart and get your data to look reasonable, even if your uncompensated data is kind of all mushed together in the middle. Okay, when you look at this in a spectral context, you have added in a much finer resolution of bandpass filters so that there is much less ignored signal. The only signal that's being ignored is the regions where other lasers um, would be. You don't wanna accidentally capture other laser light in um, and think that that's fluorescence because the laser light is obviously much, much brighter than um, the fluorescent emission. So we're minimizing the amount of the spectrum we're ignoring and we're dividing it up into much smaller slices. And now instead of some wavelengths being assigned to other floors, these other wavelengths are now all part of how we understand PE. So this is in terms of the emission. Here we're exciting with the blue laser. That's what the B up here means. But then, because we have multiple lasers in our systems, on your campus, you have a five laser system. This would be um, if there were three lasers, violet, blue, and yellow, green. Uh, PE, although it was conventionally used with a blue laser, it is actually better excited by a yellow, green laser. And um, you see that it has this same sort of like lumpy, bumpy emission curve, regardless of what laser excites it. It's just that some lasers are able to excite more fluorescent signal out of it than other lasers. We take all of this information, this is all folded into what PE looks like. Having this much information about PE allows us to use it with reagents that look very similar to PE and to find very small differences and then put those reagents together in a panel. So, I'll give, I'll go over this slide twice in the series of this talk, but I'll just give a brief introduction to sort of what uh, we're looking at. There is a lot of information that spectral cytometry is giving you, and we have a way that we visualize it, and that will help you understand some other parts of this talk, and when you're sitting in front of the instrument, will help you understand that as well. So 
The first thing to know is that our instrument has uh, spatially separated lasers and each laser is assigned to its own detector module. That means that things like tandem dyes, for instance, APC-SI7 and PSI7, they emit at the same wavelength, but they have very different sensitivities to different wavelengths of light. That's the main difference between them is what laser primarily excites them. So in order to be able to use APC-SI7 and PSI7 together, you need to um, keep track of what laser is causing the strongest signal. And so that's what we're doing by having um, the five lasers spatially separated and having each one assigned to their own detector. You may notice that we have two different side scatters. Uh, conventionally, side scatter is measured off the blue laser. The blue laser has been on the instrument for 40 years. So uh, some of the basic measurements are done off the blue laser. We added in a violet side scatter, which has been shown to give better resolution of small particles. We have both of these available, blue so you can compare to other instruments you may be using, and violet because it gives better resolution. There's also a very cute trick where when you put these two types of scatter together, you can find red blood cells because hemoglobin uh, scatters different wavelengths of light differently than white blood cells. So um, if that's ever something you're interested in, let me know and I'll send you a publication on that. Okay, so um, we have all of this information where we're keeping track of what laser is exciting the floor. And then we're keeping track of the wavelength of the emission broken into very granular segments. Uh, note that with fluorescent, with fluorescence, it can only be emitted at a longer wavelength than the excitation. You uh, can't fool mother nature. So the wavelength is always getting longer. And so that's why for the red laser, only certain parts of the spectrum are available to you. Whereas for the UV laser, a much broader part of the spectrum is available. Okay, so off of each of these lasers, we are monitoring what the fluorescence emission at each of the different wavelengths is. It's like we're scanning through all of the different wavelengths and finding both the peak emission, but also other interesting features of the fluorescent emission at different wavelengths. And so here we're seeing a floor whose strongest excitation is by the violet laser and its strongest emission is in the far red. This is actually brilliant violet 750. So this is one of these reagents from 10 years ago that really allowed you to make much better use of the violet laser. It's a tandem dye that's allowing you to take a very short wavelength of light and emit it in the far red. So to take better advantage of the lasers that are already available in flow cytometry. So regardless of what laser is exciting this floor, it is always going to emit at 750. So it sort of ramps up to its full emission and then it slopes downward from its full emission. And regardless of what wavelength you excite it with, it always has that shape. It's just a question of uh, the intensity. And if you wanna tell how the intensity varies between the different lasers, you put them all together end to end. And this is how we're showing the data. So here we have the UV excitation, violet excitation, blue, yellow, green, and red excitation. It is very common for tandem dyes to be excited by multiple lasers. And so it's extremely important with tandem dyes to keep track of exactly what laser is doing uh, the the primary excitation. Uh, and so this pattern where everything emits at 750, but it's strongest in, uh, in response to violet, there's a response to red, there's a response to UV, and there's a much dimmer response to blue and yellow green. This is on a log scale, so you can see um, that, that that's actually a pretty significant difference. That is telling you that this is a violet dye, again, I said its name is Brilliant Violet, and that it's emitting in the far red. I told you its name is Brilliant Violet 750. And so we're able to see 
uh, that same information that's in the name of the floor and that's telling you how it's gonna fit together with other reagents. And then the way we're showing the data here is essentially just a heat map. Uh, imagine that every little block on this is a histogram for that detector. We're just trying to summarize 64 detectors worth of data. And so we're using a, a heat map, but you can easily, uh, you can also view this as histograms. Though honestly, viewing 64 histograms gets a little confusing. So that's why we like our summary plot better. Okay, so in the five laser system that you have, there are a total of 64 detectors. They are divided between the different lasers. Again, there's many more for the shorter wavelength, the UV and the violet, than there are for the red because the red is covering a much smaller part of the spectrum. And so these are, one of the nice things, and I'll talk about this briefly a little bit later, is that you are always acquiring all of the signal. So as long as your reagent is able to be excited by the floors in your, by the lasers in your instruments, you don't have to swap filters in and out. Uh, sometimes you may not even have the filter that you need on campus on a conventional cytometer, or even worse, the person on the instrument before you left the wrong filter in, you can't figure out what's wrong with your data and your cells go bad before you're able to figure it out. So being able to never have to worry about swapping filters in and out um, is very helpful when you're trying to test out new reagents. Okay, the algorithm that we use to understand what's happening in this very complex multi-dimensional set of data is called spectral unmixing. Uh, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but we have put a lot of work in the software to making the interface as similar to an autocomp wizard as possible, so that if you're already using an autocomp wizard, you should feel um, that our tools are very familiar to you and hopefully a little more user-friendly than what you're used to using. Uh, but what's actually happening under the hood is uh, called spectral unmixing. So this is a algorithm that's been used in satellite imagery for decades, but it's only recently that the um, computers were basically fast enough to do this in real time, uh, because with the satellite imagery, it would all be processed after the fact. For flow cytometry, ideally you want everything to be processed while you're looking at it so that you can immediately see what your data looks like and not have to wait uh, to process it later. And so this is just a very brief introduction to what's happening under the hood uh, to hopefully give you some intuition about what's going on. Um, not not to you know have you make your own uh, implementation of this in R, just just to say this is what's happening. So you have a mixed signal. That's what happens when you have the autofluorescence of the cells combined with staining with multiple floors, each of which has their own spectrum. The thing about spectral unmixing, it assumes that the different reagents add on top of each other. So it should be pretty easy to subtract them back out once you know what each of them is. So you have to train the system on what each floor looks like, and then it's gonna go into the mixed signal and figure out what the component parts of that mixed signal are. So here we have uh, our mixed signal. It's all of the floors added together. We have trained the system on what the floors in this experiment look like. In this case, BV421, Fitzy, and APC. So we've trained it what the individual colors look like. And then it is able to take this mixed signal and assign it to its component parts. And so it's assigning each part to the appropriate floor. You're left with the autofluorescence of the cells, and you can assign that to another floor as well. And that can give you quite a lot of power to resolve very dim signals. Um, this is done using ordinary least squares to give you the best fit if there is not a perfect, perfect alignment between how you train the system and what is in your sample. Though the closer 
your sample can be to the way that you train the system, the more accurate your data is going to be. Okay, I'll talk briefly about the hardware. Um, again, mostly just to give you an idea of, of what kind of experiments you would be doing on this instrument. So the whole instrument has a relatively small footprint. Uh, the uh, monitor that goes with it has a has a pretty large footprint because there's a lot of data that you're looking at, but the cytometer itself has a small footprint. Um, this is saying it has three lasers upgradable to five. The system you guys have on campus is the five laser system. And as I mentioned before, you don't need to change filters in and out because it's always acquiring all the data and then it's processing it based on what floors you have in your particular experiment. Um, and there is a plate loader that is available on campus. Okay, so I'll go through this quickly. So this is the fluidics uh, table, essentially. Our system is driven off of vacuum. That means that you can use the same tubing to go into tubes and to go into plates. So if any of you have used a high throughput sampler in the past, you might have had this sort of finicky connection between the tubing for the high throughput sampler and the tubing uh, and the the sample injection tube. Uh, that is not the case on our system because we're using exactly the same tubing in both cases. Also because you're able to read from an open well, uh, if you needed to add an agonist into a time course experiment, that would be an option. You can also read out of a tube with a hole drilled into it, again, so you could add agonist if that was part of your assay. Um, Okay, and then uh, this is showing you a preview of what it would look like if you took off the optical cover, but um, never do that. That's where the UV laser is, and it's actually pretty dangerous. Okay, so there's the flow cell, uh, the sample station, where it's again um, able to acquire from either a tube or a plate. Uh, it's a uh, vacuum based fluidics and you do have the plate loader on campus. So we have made in basically this is the conventional way that you are thinking about flow cytometry. You have single cell suspension in a tube. You are bringing it up. You are focusing it into a single file line of cells where they each run past the lasers in a very smooth and optimized way, then you have scatter uh, light or you have fluorescent emitted light. You're detecting that light, making a electronic measurement where you convert the photons into a signal that can be read in the computer. And then uh, you have the data available to you, your multi-dimensional data often viewed two dimensions at a time. So as I said, we've made uh, improvements to the fluidics. I would say primarily the vacuum uh, is a huge advantage for reading different types of samples. Um, we have a plenum on the system that holds five minutes worth of sheath fluid. It gives you a little more flexibility if you accidentally run out of sheath fluid to uh, if you can run and fill that within five minutes, then you can keep running your experiment. Um, so yes, it allows refilling on the fly. Um, there's a inline filter that's pretty common. There's a degassing module to minimize the occurrence of air bubbles that would damage your resolution. Um, it's based on a, a linear valve, but I won't go deep into that. Our flow cell is similar to conventional flow cells. Uh, and again, we use vacuum waste. Uh, but the thing I wanted to get to on this is that we have an inline flow meter, which allows true uh, volumetric readings so that you can use this flow meter as a substitute for different types of counting beads. And if you would like validation data, I can get that for you. It's also something you could uh, validate yourself on your instrument, and then you may end up switching from counting beads to a true volumetric counting. Okay, and then um, how is what changes have we made to the way that the lasers are working? Um, so we have up to five solid state lasers, spatially separated lasers, 
and we have a complex beam shaping that is lowering the noise and increasing resolution. In conventional cytometry, usually the laser is, uh, it has a Gaussian distribution. It is hitting cells that are going perfectly in single file, much better than any cells that are kind of going around the outside. The goal of our flat top laser shape is that even if your cells are not going perfectly in single file, if some of them are coming down here, some of them are coming down here, and some of them are coming down in the middle, you're still able to get really good resolution for all of those, which allows you to use uh, I would say medium flow rate with really no worries and still get good resolution at high flow rate. I would say if you are going to use high flow rate, um, be sure that it's compatible with the resolution you need in your assay, but I have never seen any problems with our medium flow rate. So we're able to push the flow rate up and still get good resolution, even for extremely complex assays, which are really why a lot of people are moving to the Aurora is that ability to just pack so many floors in. In those situations, it's essential to have high resolution. And that's why we have our um, more elaborate uh, beam shaping. Okay, for the light collection, we are using avalanche photodiodes. They are a more modern type of detector. They have a much smaller footprint than photomultiplier tubes, which are conventionally moved, used in flow cytometry. Uh, photomultiplier tubes are actually a form of vacuum tube. The only uh, kind of vacuum tubes I've heard of being used outside of uh, like hipster amplifiers. So um, they're kind of an old technology. The avalanche photodiodes are um, much smaller and they have a better sensitivity, essentially, Across the board, the y-axis here is quantum efficiency. That means of a certain number of photons that are bombarding that detector, what percentage of them will actually be turned into electrons? If you can't turn the photon into an electron, it can't be part of your data. And so um, this is really telling you how much that light ends up in your data. So across the board, avalanche photodiodes have better sensitivity and it's, there's a huge difference in the far red. Uh, photomultiplier tubes, they start losing resolution as you get into the red, the far red, the near IR, and that limits what reagents can be used. And if you do try to use a far red or near IR reagent on a conventional cytometer, you will often find that the noise is swamping out your signal. Whereas if you have a good sensitivity, there's less noise because there's more photons and so your signal is more stable. Okay, and then electronic measurement. So the key here, I will just summarize it very quickly. One, the noise on the avalanche photodiodes is very good, allowing you to amplify the signal up and down and still uh, get a good resolution of dim versus negative populations. Uh, these numbers look relatively high, these robust standard deviation numbers, but this is on a 22-bit scale. You need to divide by 16 to get numbers you would see on a conventional 18-bit instrument. So essentially, this is telling you about low noise, which gives you um, good dim versus negative resolution, which is extremely important for populations that have a smeary or continuous expression level. Um, in terms of linearity, the avalanche photodiodes have a very good linearity as you move up through the gain scale. So the idea is that if you have two beads and one of them is 10 times as bright as the other, you want, even if they're at the low end of your signal, you want there to be a tenfold difference between them. If they're at the high end of the signal, you still want there to be a tenfold difference between them. Photomultiplier tubes are notorious for having a sweet spot where they have good linearity and outside of that, uh, not so much. And so the idea is that the combination of low noise across the board and um, high linearity, means that you can use any part of um, the detector range 
and get good data. This allows you to use one pre-optimized um, user settings for your experiments. We call it cytic assay settings. But the idea is that we were able to pre-optimize the settings and that keeps you from having to go in and optimize 64 different detectors. Um, depending on what experiments you've done in the past or what instruments you've used, you may have done voltration on a conventional cytometer. The idea is that our R&D department has done the optimization and you don't need to redo it. Okay, and then the data. Uh, I guess I'll say all of these, the fluidics, the light, and the electronic measurements result in better resolution data. And when we're looking at better resolution data, it's minimizing the spreading of the data, minimizing the noise, and also that your negatives are very well-defined and well-contained allowing you, if you need to, to distinguish dim from negative populations in an intuitive way. Okay, so um, talking a little bit more about the capabilities of the Aurora. Again, I'll just talk about this is how we're putting our signatures together. This is our brilliant violet 570. We've got our violet signal and our UV, blue, yellow, green, and red, all emitting at 750. And then we put them all together like this. Okay, how do we pack extra dyes into the panels? Uh, it's by using a combination of very small bandpass filters, very good detectors, and the ability to use spectral unmixing, which gives us more power to distinguish these things. So here we have APC and Alexa Fluor 647. These are two floors that would conventionally not be able to be used together. One would be used as a possible substitute for the other. But when you have 64 data points about each floor, you see that there's actually a number of places where they're different, in some cases actually remarkably different. These differences are enough for the algorithm to hold, to hold onto and to identify these as two different floors. And so in this case, we're looking at two highly overlapping dyes, which could not be used together in a conventional cytometer. And we have put them on markers, which are co-expressed, CD8 and CD56. And we're getting the resolution that we need to find all of the populations. So uh, despite some spreading, we are still seeing um, a clear separation of our conventional T from our NKT cells marked here with CD56 expression. And that's enough for us to have a reproducible gating because we're able to visually see the space between those two populations. I'm going to say before you design your all of your panels around using APC and Alexa Flora 647 together, um, I would say there's so many other reagents available for a small panel. You don't need to use this floor combination, but knowing that you have it in your back pocket is what lets you go up to 30, 35, 40 colors. So our R&D department is doing empirical testing of a large number of reagents to see which reagents we can empirically get to work together and also giving you information about uh, the stain index, the spillover, as many parameters as we can measure from these and make available to our customers so that you can be using this data to design your panels. And I would say if you are already doing high dimensional panel design, you're probably already using a stain index chart and a spillover spread matrix for the instrument that you're working with. And anytime you're working on a new instrument, you want to um, take advantage of the tools for that specific instrument. So um, 
In addition to the stain index, we have snapshots of what a lot of these floors look like on lymphocytes. Uh, and this can be very helpful for when you're trying to make sense of the data that you're seeing. Um, and also just for you to know that these are all reagents that we have tested and that we have some experience with on our team. Um, and also information here, I think you can see up here. So BV421 has a very distinctive signature. There is no other floors that look exactly like it. However, e 450 uh, actually looks almost exactly like Pacific Blue and Vio Blue and is not distinguishable from live dead violet. So you would only be able to pick one of the floors from, these box, from this box when you're putting together your panel, though you could potentially use one floor from this box, one floor from this box, and one floor from this box, still get high quality data. If you start packing in very high numbers of floors, you need to be careful about how you're putting the panel together, uh, but it is possible to do that and get high quality data. Okay, so uh, I've mentioned this a little bit, but I'll just run through it quickly. Um, the idea is if you are, on a conventional cytometer where one filter is assigned to each floor. It means that if you are trying to get a new floor into your lab, there's a whole process to figure out uh, whether it's gonna be compatible with the instrument that you have, whether you're gonna to need to buy a new filter and how that's gonna work. Again, you don't want, um, you need to be very careful that one person isn't leaving the wrong filters in and messing up the next person's experiment. So is the dye compatible with the filters you have as more and more dyes come on the market and may or may not be? Um, if it is compatible, you still need to be sure to update the software, um, which can sometimes be a, a time consuming process. If it's not compatible, you need to figure out if uh, it's actually possible to buy this filter and to get it in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and then you need to be sure that the filters are changed in and changed out and that nobody is leaving the wrong filters in. Um, if it's not available, then maybe you need to see if you can get a custom made uh, filter. And so this may, it may be that some floors are not gonna be compatible without major upgrades of the instrument. I've definitely seen this on some older ARIAs, I will say. Um, however, in spectral cytometry, you are collecting all the data all the time. All the filters are already there. So it's just a question of, uh, is it a dye that can be excited by the lasers we have? Uh, this is suggesting a laser upgrade, but you guys already have the five lasers. So um, it basically, um, we have the most common uh, set of five lasers for flow cytometry reagents. The further you get outside flow cytometry reagents, the more you may run into something that's not well excited by one of our lasers. Often you can try it anyway. Maybe you have a dim signal, but the better resolution we have in our system allows you to use it anyway. So I've definitely seen that. Sometimes you can use things that are suboptimal and still get, you know, be able to answer your biological question. Okay, tools that we have available. We have our fluorochrome selection guidelines, our spectrum viewer, and our similarity and complexity index. All of these tools are available on our website. Similarity and complexity is also available within the software. So you can compare what it should look like to what it actually looked like today. And then you can start to troubleshoot if it looks very different as you ran it than how you expected it to look. Um, so this is a screenshot from our spectrum viewer. So here's the floors we're talking about, APC and Alexa floor 647. Now we're seeing them normalized. So we're not looking at the heat map anymore, just the normalized data. You can see that they peak in different channels and there's some big differences in how they respond to the yellow, green, violet, and even the UV laser. And so those are all differences between the floors. Then our website will quantitate that similarity for you. Um, in this case, you're getting a score of 0 0.9 as out of one. Uh, as you put the panel together, you will also get um, 
a complexity index for the group of floors you've put together. So similarity index is comparing two floors at a time, telling you how those two floors specifically work together. Complexity index is for the whole panel. It's essentially telling you how challenging it is, is going to be to get high resolution data with that panel. So you want for a certain size of panel, you want to minimize your complexity index as much as possible. And um, I would recommend to people as they're thinking about panels, take a panel you already have, put it into our spectrum viewer and see how that panel is going to translate to the Aurora. And before you buy reagents, try putting together panels in the spectrum viewer. It will keep you from accidentally buying reagents where that may have different names, but are actually exactly the same color. So I definitely recommend playing around with our spectrum viewer uh, before purchasing your reagents. It'll, uh, you know, flag things that are not going to work for you. There's another way that you could use the similarity, and this is within the software. So you run your single stain controls. That's what you're training the algorithm with. And then you can compare them to what the administrator of the machine ran and see how similar they look. So here's a situation where somebody uh, thought they had run Fitzy, but it's pretty clear that they ran something completely different. The similarity here is 0 0.01 um, out of one. And so this is a case where they swapped their tubes and they accidentally ran APC twice and didn't run Fitzy. And so that's gonna make the experiment not work, but you can catch it here because the software tools are helping you figure out if it's working. Uh, whereas their PE and their APC uh, looked great. And so it's only this uh, Fitzy that you need to go back and rerun and the other ones are fine. One other uh, great power of using spectral unmixing is the ability to extract autofluorescence. So this is a use that um, a lot of people, if you have a high autofluorescence tissue uh, or sample, you may end up using the Aurora, even if your panels are not very complex, just because you want the autofluorescence extraction. So I'd say there's different categories of people who are specifically interested in using an Aurora. There are people who are trying to pack as many reagents into their panel at once. This allows you to have a much more complex data set and get much more information out of a limited amount of sample. Uh, so that's one group of people. Another group of people, they're working on model systems that have very poor reagent availability. And they may not be able to avoid using APC and Alexa Flora 647 together. And so having an instrument that can use those together is, is allowing them to do science that couldn't be done on another instrument. Another group of people are people where they have either a very high or very complex autofluorescence in their tissues, and then the ability to extract autofluorescence and to deal with autofluorescence um, more powerfully uh, allows them, again, to do experiments that they wouldn't be able to do on another cytometer. And so here's an example where you have HeLa cells, which have a high autofluorescence. A number of cultured cells do have a pretty high autofluorescence. And you've got a very dim uh, signal from M. cherry, which is uh, marking their CRISPR um, assay. And so you look at this, there's not much difference if you're looking at it. There's a lot of autofluorescence. And this autofluorescence is a, starting to swallow up the data and make it very hard to distinguish between the positive population and the noise coming from the autofluorescence of the cells. If you have high autofluorescence, extracting it can be extremely powerful and it can allow you to pull your negative population down to zero and create a lot of visual space between your positive and negative population. You just take the autofluorescence and put it elsewhere. It's no longer impacting your ability to find M. cherry. And now you can gate on those cells much more cleanly. So that is the, the power of autofluorescence extraction. If that's something that you uh, think would be helpful in your assay, I'm helpful to have a team's call and talk about um, you know, the best way to use that in your experiment. Okay, 
Um, let me, I'm realizing that I put too many slides in here. Let me talk about this and then I'll quickly talk about um, some of the data that we have and how it helps resolution. So the idea is that even though the algorithm is more powerful, the workflow is going to be very uh, you know, comprehensible and familiar, particularly if you used an autocomp wizard before, uh, which depending on how big of experiments you've been doing, you may or may not have been doing. So um, again, you don't have to worry about whether floors are compatible with your configuration, as long as they're able to be excited by one of the five lasers. You do not have to do a voltage optimization because we have pre-optimized those settings for you. Uh, you still need to have single stain controls. You're now using them for unmixing instead of for compensation, but you're essentially going to a wizard that is uh, following all the same guidelines as a auto comp wizard and with all the same best practices that you uh, should be using in the auto comp wizard. Uh, and then you're able to acquire your data and immediately see it in familiar looking flow cytometry plots. So you don't have to worry about all the 64 detectors. You just need to worry about your own data. There is also a possibility because of the way we've designed the hardware and software to reuse reference controls and get very stable data. We have done a lot, we've put a lot of energy into normalizing for any variability in the hardware. That doesn't cover variability in the reagents, variability in the sample prep, but uh, comp you know, taking account of any variability in the instrument can be very powerful. And then you as the user are responsible for minimizing the variability in your reagents and in your staining protocols. Okay, and so that can make the workflow much more elegant. Once you've finished your assay development phase, you're ready to go into your real experimental data acquisition phase. Uh, you can have a very streamlined and elegant workflow. Okay, uh, I will just say, if you have a very stable sample, stable reagent, stable uh, preparation, uh, having the hardware normalized gives you extremely stable data over a period of months. You may find that you're not able to have your reagents be this stable. This is actually using lyophilized reagents, but it um, gives you an idea of what is possible. And then let me talk a little bit about this because the thing I want to talk most about um, I'll just say briefly that in order to go into unsupervised analysis, you need to have very high quality data. And so we are proud of how well our data, the resolution of our data allows it to go into TISNI and UMAP. And if you have more questions about that, we have a whole talk on that that's available on our user forum, which you guys are able to register with, with your emails, with your campus emails. Okay, so the thing, the part of this I actually wanted to show you was the difference in resolution. First, here's uh, one of the main ways that people want to use an Aurora is to take an assay they were previously doing in multiple tubes, combine it into one tube. This, um, not only does it save sample for very precious samples, it also, um, you can find new populations. Uh, you can end up, if you have a three tube assay with really interesting populations falling through the cracks between the different parts of your assay. If you have it all in one tube, you can track everything about every single cell and get a much finer resolution data. So this is just an example of looking at a panel that was run in three tubes conventionally and then putting the panel together carefully, and now you're only running one tube for the whole assay. You're getting the same resolution for those markers as before, but now you're getting more information because you now know a lot more about each event because you now have many more markers that are all being put together. And then uh, th there's just two examples of that data where the data is looking very similar between the three tube assay and the one tube assay in terms of your resolution. The other thing that I want to talk about is 
spillover spreading and resolution. And then after this, I'll just zip to the end of the talk. Here is a panel, we put together a panel that was able to be looked at on both a conventional cytometer and our cytometer. And to say um, in which ways, how is the data looking different? So the first thing that you see is that there is a lot more spillover on a conventional cytometer with this group of floors, a lot less spillover on the aurora with this group of floors. This is a very standard chart. If you have done high dimensional panel design before, you may have spent a lot of time looking at spillover spread matrices, and that's essentially what we're showing you. The spillover spread matrix is going to be different for each different configuration of an instrument, and so it's often useful to compare these. Essentially, what you're seeing is that many different reagent combinations are being flagged on a conventional cytometer that are more or less fine on a Aurora. And this is giving you more power. This is how you pack all those extra floors in, is that you pack in the reagents and you're still able to get good resolution. The, what do those numbers mean? What does it mean to have something be flagged in red on that chart? It means that you're losing resolution when you're looking at the data. For instance, in your ability to find TCR gamma delta, in your ability to gate on populations and have them well-defined and to find all of the populations without them spreading uh, to such a degree that that spread is swallowing up populations that you care about. Again, one of the things that we are very proud of is our resolution of those negative populations versus dim, allowing you to find uh, in a intuitive and reproducible way, the line between your dim and your negative populations. And again, um, this data is much more usable than this data. And note that these are scaled the same way to show you where the spreading is starting to damage data quality. OK, so uh, sorry that I skipped over a bunch of biological data. I can stay a little bit later if anyone would like uh, to answer, you know, have specific questions. I can show you some of that data if you'd like. Uh, but thank you for joining me for the talk, and I hope that you'll find that this inspires you to think of experiments that you can move to the Aurora. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Um, and uh, I'd like to open up the floor to, to questions um, and a reminder for people who've had to have to leave. Um, this is recorded, so we should be able to post this up on our um, uh, up on our website, and I can get you more details later if you'd like. Um, is there anybody who would like to speak? our ask questions. Um, it's kind of a lot of people on my screen. Uh, so, so if you feel want to just chime in and ask questions, um, I would appreciate it. But thank you, Eleanor. It was a very lovely talk. Um, Leonid, Hi, welcome. Eleanor. Uh, thank you very much for a um, uh, very interesting uh, introductory talk. And uh, so I'm a immunologist, and um, our lab is very interested in using, of course, uh, multi-dimensional uh, cytometers. And uh, it feels like it's almost a substitution to CyTOF. Um, and um, so I have a question uh, like close to my home. Uh, and that is about, um, uh, uh, so you mentioned that you're looking at um, certain um, fluorochromes, uh, like uh, uh, like synthetic fluorochromes, but we are using also uh, some uh, GFP uh, or like uh, similar um, fluorochromes, which can be expressed in cells. Yes. And uh, uh, so I know that uh, many of these uh, living uh, colors they. They, they are not compatible uh, with each other, right? So you cannot uh, fully distinguish, for example, GFP and YFP, or you need certain tricks. And uh, again, so uh, it, does your company, um, because I didn't look at the website, so I'm guilty, but does your company actually 
um, somehow um, developing uh, de develops tools for, like to distinguish um, very close uh, living colors. Uh, so what I would say is the the way that we're doing the spectral unmixing already gives us a lot of power for looking at right. things like GFP and YFP together. I will say that most of our sample data is clinical data without fluorescent proteins, but a lot of our customers do want to look at fluorescent proteins. The latest version of our fluorochrome selection guideline and the most updated version of our spectrum viewer include a lot of fluorescent proteins on there, and you can see what the similarity and complexity is, and that's just running them at our pre-optimized settings. And, and is it uh, possible, like for example, if you didn't look for like exotic uh, fluorescent proteins, like I don't know, ZS green or blue fluorescent protein or some others, is it possible to somehow um, teach the machine to um, uh, detect these proteins uh, and fluorescence and then so like you mentioned, like uncouple the data? Uh, yes, I, I mean, there are limits, obviously, uh, but the way that you train the system is you have a pure version of that color. And sometimes that is the trickiest part in an experiment. Though, for instance, with the confetti mice, for example, one of the tools that people use, there are single stained pop or single color populations that are mixed in with other populations you can draw gate around that population make a new file with it and use that to teach the algorithm so as long as you can find a source of just the single stained cells even if you need to go in and cut it out of another experiment you can use that to train the system and actually none of the signatures come loaded in the software you always need to train the software what the floors look like so that often that is the holdup for people is getting the source of the pure single color to train the system and that's something i can work with you try and find other techniques that other people have used Sometimes people are able to use the fluorescent uh, beads that are sort of quasi commercially available, or sometimes you can just express it. If it's a common fluorescent protein, often you have the vector, you can just express it in 293 cells and use that as a way to train the system. So you, you need a way to train the system, but if you have that, it is very powerful for things that have pretty small differences in their emission. I would also say since your campus has the system with the yellow green laser, that really helps with all of the fruit proteins, which are which can be a little more challenging if you don't have the yellow green laser. So. And and would you recommend for um, um, uh, running single colors? Would you recommend to use uh, beads uh, with an antibodies and uh, uh, which we're using or? Uh, staining uh, cells? What we have found yeah. is that there's a number of reagents that don't look quite right on the beads. Mm -hmm. And the it's actually something that happens in conventional cytometry too, but you it's hard to figure. It's, if you see a problem with beads on a conventional cytometer, it can be hard to diagnose it. Once you have the whole spectrum in front of you, it's easier to diagnose it. So Yes, we will say the compensation beads do not work perfectly for every single reagent. And we would actually recommend that you see how everything looks on cells, if possible, and then swap in as many beads as you can without losing the quality of your data. And so we would consider that part of the assay development is that you're setting aside time to say, Ideally, I want to use beads, but I only want to use beads where it's not damaging the data quality. And we have a, a recent publication for our 40 color panel. And we, we talk about in our supplemental materials, we have a lot of information about how we made all the choices that we made. And we ended up being able to use, um, I think out of 40 colors, only six 
we couldn't do on beads. But it is reagent specific. So we had to test it to get there. Oh, it's it's very impressive. Thank you very much. And I have last question. I don't want to hijack the whole conversation. <laughs> uh, Amy, I'm sorry, but uh, the 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 um, I also uh, have a practical question about um, fluidics. For example, uh, we are uh, we run IELs, and uh, as you know, it's clogging very much the machine normally. Yes. So. Uh, you, you mentioned that you have slightly different fluidics, and uh, does it help um, uh, to, to run smoothly? Um, yes, but IELs are always a challenge. Like, I'm not going to say that, uh, that IELs are, any digested tissue is always a challenge. So I think it is easier. Mm -hmm. it's, it is, I would say, the high throughput sampler, that, which is a separate piece with its own fluidics, is a disaster for digested or sticky tissues because it has this very, very narrow tubing that's hard to clean. Our instrument, it has one tubing. It is essentially the type of tubing that you have on a ARIA. Mm -hmm. It's that peak tubing with a similar diameter. Comparing to sorting is challenging because obviously in sorting, it, you also risk clogging the nozzle. Yes. But, um, and in this case, there's no nozzle. So I would say it's always possible to clog it. Um, you may end up having to use DNAs. Our uh, plate loader has refrigeration on it, which can help quite a lot to keep samples from re... Digested tissue loves to like try to put itself back together into a glue ball and having refrigeration on can help with that. Um, I think it's better, but it's it's... You can't just ignore it, <laughs> I guess sure, I would say. Sure. <laughs> it's similar, that's all. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Eleanor. Um, if uh, anybody has any more questions, um, but we're, we have run out of time. Um, I'm, I've also am happy to forward any questions to Eleanor, um, and I'm sure she's happy to um, chat with anybody. So thank you all. Great. Thank you guys so much for the time. And I hope that you come up with really great and innovative experiments for the instrument. I love to see people doing really cool stuff with Aurora. Well, thanks, Eleanor. I mean, you've been great. And I'm sure you'll be hearing from us uh, multiple times <laughs> over the next few years. So, <laughs> all right. Appreciate it. Y'all have a great one.